Chapter 1. Questioning the Witness The Red Prince arrived in a much heavier parka than her normal jean jacket, but rest assured her jean jacket was beneath her heavier jacket. Even at night, she wore her silver sunglasses as she approached the house. Even now, at the late hour, she had an air of quiet power. The officers were standing around trying to look busy without being busy, something Red was all too familiar with. Crime scene investigation was taking pictures of what they thought could be evidence, but considering the fact how rotted the house was, ev any evidence was virtually impossible to find. Lieutenant Louise Tennant, Lieutenant Lou Tennant to her officers, was a shorter white woman who always wore her badge and bulletproof vest proudly displaying she was RCPD. Her red hair was tied back in a hair bun and she had freckles behind her glasses. Even if it wasn't for her vest, badge, and gun, she probably would have looked like a librarian, especially with the clipboard and notebook she always carried with her. Red couldn't be more different from Lieutenant Tennant. Red was a tall, black woman with a quiet, thoughtful face. While the officer would stand up straight trying to look like an authority figure, Red was usually relaxed and made others feel relaxed around her. Red's hair was cut short, almost buzzed, while Lieutenant's Hair was long and in a bun. While Lieutenant was prominently showing a, a badge and RCPD on her bulletproof vest, Red usually wore a jean jacket with patches from local bands and a golden crown in a red oval. On Red's left breast pocket was a purple heater, a shield shape, with the golden letters PRINCE spelled out. On Lieutenant's right breast was Lieutenant Tenant. Something that they both had in common was people immediately thinking that they were just, they were men just from their names alone. Something that they both came to expect, but both of them were sick of. The police lieutenant approached the detective and began to tell Red what the police could figure out, which wasn't a whole lot, a whole lot, but any details were helpful details. Tenant would read off the clipboard while Red pulled out her grimoire, making mental notes of the environment and on what Lieutenant was saying. After preparing follow -up question, already preparing follow-up questions and ideas on who to inquire about after leaving the scene of the crime. We were called about 20 minutes ago before we arrived. The caller said that she was called, that she called as soon as she heard two gunshots. She said she couldn't see the attacker, but it looked like they were wearing a black gas mask, a red glowing sword, and carried a shotgun with them. She said, the killer was at least seven feet tall and almost certainly a man, she explained to Red. But Red rose her hand, she pointed at a shoe print in the mud, coated in frost and what looks like dust mixed with a familiar clear gel, ectoplasm. The Red Prince gestured to it and some of the investigators took pictures of the footprint. Already from looking at how deep the footprint was and how large it was, it was extremely unlikely that the person was a seven foot tall man. Still, a footprint would be a good st start if it wasn't obvious most people in River City wore shoes with these treads. So your eyewitness is less than reliable, Red said to Tennant. This was hardly anything new. Eyewitness testimony isn't always useful, especially since the description given for the attacker also matched a popular video game character. Both of the women began to head indoors to see the other evidence. The porch creaked when they stepped on it, but unlike most haunted houses, the feelings of dread and the infrasound caused by a phantom presence was gone. The house just felt like any other abandoned house. Still, deep in Red's bones, she could still feel that this house wants new magic and love. But something came through recently to wipe that away. Probably someone trying to hide something, confusing erasing something as the same thing as fixing it. The question now burning in Red's mind was, who would stand to benefit from sending these ghosts to judgment? And who has the power to send ghosts to judgment against their will? The investigators continued taking pictures of the areas where the ectoplasm cleared off the dust. No other evidence left of the ghosts that had passed away in this house. In a corner, the crying ghost was still crying. None of the other officers even tried to get close to her because of how cold the air was around her. Red Prince approached her while writing in her grimoire. The air was freezing and forced a chill down Red's spine. This was just the cold, however. 
Deep in her heart, she knew that the ghost woman was just scared and sad. This chill wasn't her trying to hurt someone. If this frozen phantom wanted to freeze someone, they would be a fully frostbitten sculpture right now. So trying to isolate her like the officers were doing wasn't going to be helping anyone or anything. Least of all, the investigation. Humming a soft song, the Red Prince took out a piece of paper from the grimoire and held it up for the spirit to see. The ghost stopped, cr stopped crying for the first time in a long time and read the paper. Seeing the shifting script, the ghost felt warmth inside of her. For some reason, the moving letters helped her feel better, more in control, more of herself, and less of her afterlife curse. For the first time in over a hundred years, she took a deep breath. <gasps> there was no real relief to her non-existent lungs. Oxygen wasn't needed in her body, but the reflex remained with her. Her instincts resurrected by the sight of the shifting script. Following one of the oldest habits learned by the living, even in death, routine was a comfort. The air just moved through her, but the act of trying to breathe did help ground her to what was happening here and now. A few deep breaths and the air around her warmed. The frost that spiderwebbed out from where she sat began to melt and the frozen years of tears on her dress began to flake away from the ghost. Even though she was technically weightless, her burden lightened somehow. Now she was able to think a bit more clearly. The ghost gestured to the paper that Red held, and the detective smiled as she gave the ghost the piece of paper. The ghost held the paper. Caracio was written on it in shifting script. A simple spell, but useful one in helping ghosts break out of their respective curses. Glancing up the the detective, the ghost eyed her suspiciously, trying to figure out what was going on. This woman looked nothing like the other officer, especially with her mirror glasses. These glasses, however, reflected the ghost back at her when most mirrors don't. The detective had a scar over her left eyebrow peeking out from under her shades, short hair almost to her skin, and her jean jacket covered in patches. Some of the patches had a glow, similar to ectoplasm, that along with the shifting script told the ghost that this detective was more than she seemed. The detective extended her hand to the ghost offering it for her to shake. The ghost shook it after a moment of waiting. Her hands were as cold as ice yet the detective didn't flinch. Her hands glowed with the unseen energy that could only be seen with very special eyes or under a black light. Warmth flowed into the ghost's hand as the detective spoke. Hello there. What's your name? My name is Red. Red Prince, Red said to the ghost. The ghost tilted her head, a bit confused by the detective's name. It happened a lot to Red, but she was used to it by now. People who knew her well also didn't think about it anymore. The ghost here was badly hurt by what happened, and if she was focusing on Red's strange name, then it was a great start. My name? I'm... I'm not sure. It's been so long. No one has called me by my name in so long, she said, resting her hands on her head as the cobwebs in her mind got thicker and harder to sift through. What was her name? She must have had a name at some point. All the other ghosts had names. She remembered calling each of them by name. But why did they never call her name back to her? Somehow that cobweb covered thought felt dangerous like it might have a venomous spider in it. Well, how about this? Let's go back to that question when you fill up for answering that question. Do you remember your age? Red asked the sad spirit. The ghost nodded and removed her hands from her head as she looked back up at the detective who had asked her the question. The ghost's eyes were a shining brown instead of her supernatural blue. The thoughts around her age were a lot less covered in cobwebs. Sort of like a book that hadn't been used in a while, but still proudly on the bookcase, instead of hidden deep in the spider's basement. I... I was 19 when I died. I think I have been 19 for almost 100 years, so that must make me 1900 years old, she said with a smile. At first Red was about to correct her, but then decided that now wasn't the time to try and explain math to someone who may or may not be joking. 
Instead, she wrote down the age and rough amount of years that the ghost had was haunting the house. Okay, very good. Now, is there anything you can tell me about the house before tonight? Anything you think about why someone might want to come into the house? The still nameless ghost tapped her chin and thought. She couldn't remember much from the days of life. It was like trying to remember a dream that someone else described to her. The last century of crying and freezing anything that came near her felt more real than the detective next to her or the police in her room. Her life was fleeting, mostly sad, and full of empty details. Mirrors covered by sheets, her parents yelling, an emptiness in her belly, teachers yelling, strangers yelling. So much of her life she could remember was yelling. But then she grabbed onto a firm, warm thought, a smile from someone she loved. A thermos of soup passed from someone to her so she wasn't as hungry. A summer night beneath stars laying on a blanket with someone. Someone wearing a warm jacket and whose hands were wrapped around her shoulder. I'm, I'm sorry, my mind is still f f fuzzy. I cannot recall much. I do re remember that I wasn't a part of the family. I think I was v visiting them for some reason on the night that I... She stopped there, sitting so still that she may as well have been a sculpture. If Red wasn't looking right at her, she might have forgotten who she was talking to, shaking her head to clear away the ghost mimetic mechanism of memory melting. My name? M my name is T -T -T Tiffany, I think. I wasn't part of the family, Tiffany thought out loud in a voice so low, it was practically just a stray breeze. Red almost missed it, but instead she tried to offer it back to the ghost like it was a question. Would you like it if I referred to you as Tiffany? Yes, I, I would like that very much. Do you remember how the others were sent away? The, the 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 hunter had a gun with them. It spat out silver bullets, shot me in my heart, but unlike the others, I didn't disappear. Why didn't I disappear? She asked close to tears again. Now the guilt of being the only spiritual survivor was weighing heavily on her heart. She felt an arm wrap around her, a gentle reminder that someone was here with her. And unlike the others, Red wasn't ignoring her. If you were shot in the heart, may we see the bullet fired at your heart? It would help us identify where the bullets came from, and hopefully give us a link to who shot you and your friends, Red offered. Tiffany nodded and took a deep breath. As she focused on her hand, and plunged it deep into her own chest. Moving through her own chest, she felt so strange, but had to focus on getting the bullet out of her. The tingling finally stopped when she felt something hot in her hand. Pulling it out of her chest, she let out another long breath. She was unaware of how much it hurt to have the silver bullet in her heart until it was no longer there. Now the vague feeling of burning was gone. The bullet was still warm in her hand as she offered it to Red. The detective lifted a hand up, indicating she needed to just wait one moment. Then Red picked up a pair of latex gloves and put them on before she took the bullet. Carefully, she inspected it to see that the bullet was unique. Made of high quality silver, a laser engraved name, which was extremely expensive to personalize for a bullet, let alone three, and finally, the name itself was Melvin. Clearly, the killer intended this bullet for Melvin. However, the rules with ghosts were very tricky. Silver bullets only worked if inscribed with the ghost's true name, usually meaning that if there was only one shot to take out the ghost. And with dealing with something as deadly as ghosts, your first chance was usually your only chance. 
So Red's clues so far was that the killer was someone who knew how to kill ghosts, someone who was wealthy enough to buy the silver bullets and then get them laser engraved safely, someone who knew the name of two of the ghosts but not Tiffany's name, and yet was also enough of a crack shot to conf confidently attack three ghosts in their own haunted house. The most likely motive was probably money too. Someone seeking revenge normally would go to a cheaper and much more visceral spirit trap. Tell me, if there were no more ghosts in this house, who does the property go to? Red asked Lieutenant. Tenant let out a groan uh, and shuffled through her entire clipboard, finally making it to the bottom paper and saw what she had on local property and zoning laws. The laws about this were a bit complicated and she didn't normally deal with this part of the law, but still she was really glad she picked up those papers when she was called to check over in the house. Looks like the house would be ceded to city government and then it would either be put up for auction or the city may inside to just tear it down and build something else here, but I'm not sure what this would have to do with this, the police officer said, while Red's mind was already formulating a hypothesis. Still, there wasn't enough evidence, but she would have to keep searching for evidence, careful not to let her own hypothesis color her collecting. All the evidence pointed towards somebody had something to gain from the loss of all these ghosts. And since Tiffany was still here and not facing judgment, that meant whoever they are, whatever they're trying to gain, they didn't get it. However, there was still a possibility they would return and finish the job if they think they could get away with it. So it was only a matter of time until Tiffany was a target once again. <laughs>